it's indeed a matter of big pleasure for me and honor to be here in front of you all. And I'd like to thank Professor Jacques Stigrou. I hope I pronounced correctly <laughs> for his kind introduction and kind invitation. And also thanks to my friend Rajendra for arranging everything. Uh, as Professor introduced, I'm originally from Nepal, a low-income country. I did my oncology training in Japan, a high-income country. And I saw the differences in the healthcare system in these two different settings firsthand. And uh, I got interested in cancer policy. So I have been working more on cancer policy, global, can global oncology lately. And I did, completed my PhD just a week ago. And I have been working now for the Anti-Cancer Fund, which is your neighbors <laughs> just nearby. Uh, and the title of my talk today is Sense in Oncology. How similar data are interpreted differently by the oncology community. So I have no conflicts of interest. So this uh, topic, this title is actually an expansion of a paper I published in JCO a year ago. And it was titled Same Data, Different Interpretations. And this paper was very well received by the oncology community. It was one of the most popular uh, papers in JCO, one of the most downloaded papers in JCO. So people received it very well. So I thought to expand on it. Uh, so in that paper, what we talked about is we gave three examples, one from lung cancer, one from ovarian cancer, and one from breast cancer. And we argued that the data were similar for, for example, the use of bevacizumab and cetuximab in lung cancer. The data are equally strong or weak depending on your viewpoint, but bevacizumab is approved and widely used for lung cancer. Cetuximab is not approved uh, and not used. Similarly, in breast cancer, bevacizumab and Everolimus, both of them improve PFS, don't improve OS. One was approved and revoked later by the US FDA. Everolimus is still on the market, used by everyone. So similar type of data, but the way we are treating those data and the way these data are influencing practice and guidelines are different. So that was what we highlighted in, in, in this paper. But uh, today, I want to give a few more examples on that, such as, OK. For pancreatic cancer, now pancreatic cancer, as we all know, is a very lethal disease with very poor survival. And we had an exciting trial from Japan called the JASPAC-1 trial, sorry. And it showed that the use of S1 versus the standard of care, which is gemcitabine, improved survival by 21 months. Now this is a huge margin of benefit, and this is overall survival. Uh, we rarely see such difference in overall survival in cancer. And this is pancreatic cancer, which is usually very lethal. And let's compare that with the SPAC4 trial, similar setting, pancreatic cancer. And the control arm is the same, gemcitabine. And the intervention is gemcitabine plus capcitabine. And it improved survival by 2.5 months, which is a decent thing for pancreatic cancer. And both of them are significant, statistically significant. Now you would expect as a patient or as a physician to see these two data side by side. And the control arm has nearly similar overall survival, 25.5 months in both uh, the trials. Of course, we can't make cross-trial comparison. But we notice that yes one is a very good drug for pancreatic cancer. Now, if you see the toxicities of these two different, uh, from these two different trials, in case of S1, you see that, in fact, yes one is uh, except for these two toxicities, most of the toxicities are in fact lower with S1 than compared to gemcitabine. If you see the quality of life data, S1 in fact improves your quality of life. So you have a drug in pancreatic cancer that improves survival by 21 months, improves your quality of life with lesser toxicities. And now you have gemcitabine plus capcitabine in the SPAC trial, which improves survival by 2.5 months. And quality of life, quality of life, no significant effect. Yes, one improved. It did not change any quality of life. And if you see toxicities, toxicities was significantly higher because you are adding one extra drug to gemcitabine. So if I, I as a patient, have an option between 
trying S1 for pancreatic cancer versus using gemcitabine plus capcitabine, it's a no-brainer for me. I would go with S1. But now let's see how guidelines have changed. Now this is NCCN guideline, and NCCN guideline puts gemcitabine plus capcitabine as category one recommendation, mentions about the SPAC4 trial, and there is no mention at all about S1, not even an option, not even category three. So this looks lack of sense in oncology to me. And this, uh, like what's going on feeling is very common in oncology, and it's not only with uh, those uh, trials that I discussed with treatment, but also with the screening. For example, this is the USPSTF screening grade, and A means very high quality evidence, very big margin of benefit in mortality, so you should screen. B means the margin is a little bit less, but screen. C means don't know, talk with the patient, there is harm. So if the patient wants, screen. If the patient doesn't want, don't screen. D means don't screen, it is harmful. Now let's see a few examples. So prostate cancer screening, PSA based screening gets D. That means don't screen. Next, breast cancer mammography screening, depending on your age, it receives B or C. Talk with the patient if she wants, screen. If she doesn't want, don't screen. And lung cancer screening for high risk patients who are heavy smokers receives B, that means screen. Now let's see what is actually the percentage of patients who get a screening. Okay, prostate, it receives D, don't screen. Let's see the data. The data shows that even among patients who are 75 years or older, who will possibly never get any benefit from screening, even those patients, 38% of them are still getting screening, PSA-based screening. Guideline says don't screen. These are patients over 75 years of old, and 38% of them are still getting screening. Now let's see for mammographic screening, which receives C and B, depending on age. And the data is, we don't have age-based data, but overall, 67% of them get screening. Now let's see that for lung cancer. Okay, for our recap, D, don't screen, gets 38%. B and C gets up to 67% are screened. And finally, B, you would expect if D gets, if 38% of people are getting screening with recommendation D, 68% are getting with C plus B mixed, then B, you would expect like 90, 95% should be screened, right? Because it says screen. But now let's see what percent of patients actually get screened. And we start with the heading, lung cancer screening rates remain very low. And the actual data is that only 3.9% of the patients get screened. So this is unacceptable. D getting 30, up to 38% and B, clear cut, getting up to only 4% is a lack of sense in oncology to me. So after coming across all these discrepancies in oncology, uh, I thought that maybe we should start a center for sense in oncology, a center for common sense, uh, that would be prudent. And this idea came to me uh, because I'm a big fan of Richard Feynman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and in his famous book called Surely You Are Joking, Mr. Feynman. That's his autobiography. In that book, he writes, there is a very interesting paragraph in which he says, John and his father go out to look at the stars. John sees two blue stars and a red star. His father sees a green star, a violet star, and two yellow stars. What is the total temperature of the stars seen by John and his father? And I would explode in horror. There is no purpose whatsoever in adding the temperature of two stars. He is recollecting his experience of reading a mathematics textbook for school children. So he was a reviewer, and the government said, are these math textbooks good for school children? Please review. And he saw this question, sorry, back. He saw this question in the textbook. So he was like, OK, that is teaching arithmetic, teaching addition. But what's the purpose? Why would anyone want to add the temperature of five stars? It makes no sense at all. So I got the exact same feeling when I saw it, those data in oncology and making different conclusions. So I, I, I exploded in horror. 
exactly what happened to him. So I thought we should have a center for science and oncology. And fortunately, I have a place to shout, and that is my blogs. I write monthly blogs, and in my blog, I ranted about it, and I said, maybe we should have a center for science and oncology. That's how it started. And what does this center for science and oncology do is, of course, there is no clear cut plan for that yet. But I thought maybe we should start a center for science and oncology that specifically focuses on patient and physician education. Because education is important in order to avoid such type of uh, discrepant uh, treatment of data. For example, one important thing that we need to educate ourselves and our patients is the difference between hope versus hype. There is a lot of hype going on in, in oncology, in public media, and among we oncologists and scientists. Uh, because we can't differentiate between what is actually hopeful data that can benefit patient versus something that has been hyped by the media or by ourselves. So I'll go through some of them in today's talk. For example, if we go about hope versus hype, there is one very nice example. This was uh, a trial published in Lancet Oncology, a very sexy drug with a sexy name, <coughs> padeliporfin. And this is a drug used for prostate cancer, low risk prostate cancer. And this is a phase three trial of padeliporfin versus active surveillance. And this trial made very big headlines. Now these are the headlines. This is from the Guardian. It says, laser activated drug a leap forward for prostate cancer treatment. Another headline says, it could be a game changer. So this is a drug that is being said, leap forward, game changer. And interesting thing is, this is a drug derived from bacteria found at the bottom of the sea. Sounds very super cool. From bottom of the sea, you have a bacteria and you activate it with laser to make a drug which is called padeliporfin. And it's a game changer. Now let's see what exactly it is. OK, to give you an example of hype, and now, nowadays, we can objectively measure hype, and it's a very interesting thing to look at. We have something called altmetric score. Have you heard about it? Altmetric score gives a score for the online presence of any particular article. So how many times it has been in news, how many times it has been tweeted, how many times it has been blogged, it counts all those things, and it gives a score. So in general, if the altmetric score is like 100, it's a very important study. It has made lots of noise. So getting an altmetric score of 100 will make any author very happy. Now let's see how much altmetric this got. It got 1,354. This is like unbelievable score, above 1,000. This made so much of headline. It was picked up by 153 news, blogged by three, tweeted by 163, on eight Facebook pages, on six Google posts. So you have all this data, and this is very amazingly high score. Now this yes one, this poor drug that we talked about before, that improved survival by 21 months, but did not change guidelines. Now let's see how people are excited about it. It has an altmetric of only 26, not even 100, not even 50. This is a very, very low score, very low score. Just for comparison, for example, these are random blogs, and they get an score of 53, 72. And this is a drug in pancreatic cancer that is improving survival by 21 months, and it has an altmetric score of 26. Now let's see th that drug, which had an altmetric of 1300, how much efficacious is it? Now this is a drug for prostate cancer. And the control arm is active surveillance. That means no, no treatment. So you are comparing a drug with not giving anything. And now you see, if we see it metastasis, how many patients will progress to develop metastasis? It's zero in both the arm. So even if you don't do anything, nobody will go and develop metastasis. Prostate cancer related death, zero in both the arms. How can you improve on zero? You can't improve on zero. So this is a drug that does not, or cannot, because even if you don't do anything, patients are not going to die of the disease. And 
now experts are even debating whether to call it a cancer or not. Because if nobody is going to die, then why should we call it a cancer and scare our patients? So in such condition, we have a drug that is being called game changer and live forward. So what game did it exactly change? That is the question. So in the same context, this is another data that will tell the same thing. For localized prostate cancer, this is 10 year data, the PROTECT trial, even if you don't do anything for 10 years, only eight people are going to die from prostate cancer versus you do surgery five, you do radiotherapy four. So there is no difference at all in any treatment. So we already have surgery and radiotherapy and, and we are concluding that it is not essential to do surgery or radiotherapy, but we are promoting a new drug as an alternative, as a game changer, simply because it has a very cool name and was derived from the bottom of the sea. That is why I think we need patient and physician education. We need to educate ourselves, but we also need to be very wise in how we communicate the data to the patients because not always what the patient understands is what we say. The patient understands something different versus what we say. So we need to be very careful about it. And there was one very interesting study published in JAMA Oncology uh, last year you know, by one of my friends, uh, Vinay Prasad. And he looked at the use of superlatives in cancer research. Uh, and he looked at these superlative words in cancer, breakthrough, game changer, miracle, cure, home run, revolutionary, transformative, lifesaver, groundbreaking, marvel. So he looked at all the news articles that had used such type of words. And he found that 50% of these drugs, they had not even received FDA approval. Forget about PFS or OAS or response rate. Half of them had not even been approved. And we are using these terms to describe those drugs. That's why we need to educate. Now, this is a very nice example. Maybe, by the way, I'm talking, everyone will give the correct answer. But usually, I present this at the beginning of my talk. And I have here two hazard ratios. One is 0 0.6, one is 0 0.3. And I ask people, which do you think, and both of them are for the same cancer, which do you think is the hazard ratio of an immunotherapy drug? 0 0.6 or 0 0.3 for same cancer? And usually the answer I get is 0 0.3 because I asked it at the beginning of my talk and people, all of us are very excited about immunotherapy. But the answer would be that 0 0.6 is by pembrolizumab and 0 0.3 is this excellent hazard ratio is obtained not by any drug, but by simply the use of web-based application to record patient reported outcomes. This excellent kaplan meier graph. So what I'm trying to convey here is it's not always essential to use very, uh, I mean, we can have some very excellent outcomes even with the use of some simple innovative ideas. A simple idea that you record patient reported outcomes with the use of web-based application, mobile application, and you treat accordingly, and it can give you such excellent results. And these are the things that are applicable throughout the world. Straight away, people in Africa can use this. Wherever people have smartphones, wherever people have internet, they can make use of this, this thing. And this doesn't cost a lot. And this can give you such excellent results. But we have been so biased that this result was published last year. It was presented in last year's ASCO, in 2016. But I don't think this has changed practice in many institutions, have it? No. But this, it has changed practice everywhere, wherever people can afford it. So that is the crux of our underlying subconscious belief that expensive or newer is always equal to better. Now, I'll give you one more example how we subconsciously or consciously think that expensive or newer drugs should always lead to better outcomes and older or cheaper drugs might not be good. This is small cell lung cancer, a very difficult cancer to treat, very poor prognosis. In small cell lung cancer, we had a trial of ipilimumab, the new checkpoint inhibitor, and it was a negative trial. Ipilimumab failed. But let's look at the editorial of this trial. The editorial says, <coughs> The editorial says that this trial failed, but the editorial says 
although overall survival was not improved, maybe we should keep on trying in combination, it will improve in future, we should keep doing trials. Okay. Now let's see it another study. Bevacizumab, same disease, small cell lung cancer. Bevacizumab, this is also a negative trial, failed. Now let's see what the editorial says. The editorial says this is a non-significant improvement. What does that even mean? If it is non-significant, you don't know whether it is improvement or not. The confidence interval is spanning one. But it says Bevacizumab has led to non-significant improvement. Now let's see that with statin, very cheap drug, old drug, same disease, small cell lung cancer. Again, this is also a negative trial. Statin also failed as did ipilimumab and bevacizumab. We saw how ipilimumab was treated when it failed, how bevacizumab was treated by the editorialist when it failed. Now statin failed and the editorialist says additional, additional prospective trials of statins to improve survival in other cancers are likely not justified. This is very absurd. Ipilimumab fails, let's try again. Bevacizumab fails, it is non-significant, but it is improvement. Statin fails, and it does not say, let's not try statin in lung cancer, but it says, let's not try statin in any other cancer. It failed in one cancer, and the editorial says, okay, full stop, we should not try this in any other cancer. This is very important, and this is an example of our subconscious bias, because this has very huge implications. Ipilimumab, if we get a positive result, 10% of patients will benefit, maybe throughout the world. Bevacizumab, maybe 15%. Statin, if we find a good result, everyone from Nepal to Africa to US to Belgium, anyone can easily use it from tomorrow, from their pocket. But we are very biased against cheaper drugs and very biased towards expensive drugs. Now, one more example. Cisplatin pemetrexid for non ischoimous lung cancer. Now, this is a textbook uh, recommendation. Like, we get this in our exam questions. If the lung cancer histology is non ischoimous, what do you use? In options, you have pemetrexid cisplatin or gemcitabin cisplatin, and you have to tick in pemetrexid cisplatin, which is the correct answer. So, this has become like a textbook thing. All the guidelines say you should use cisplatin pemetrexid if it is non ischoimous, cisplatin gemcitabin if it is ischoimous. Let's go before, before. So what is it based on? It is based on this trial. That recommendation is based on this Iscagliotti trial. And this trial, let's see how strong the evidence is. Because we have been telling pemetrexid for non-ischoimous, gemcitabine for ischoimous. So we need to see how, how strong the evidence is. Because NCCN guideline also clearly says there is superior efficacy and reduced toxicity for cisplatin pemetrexid in non ischoimous I agree about reduced toxicity. I have no problem about that. But I want to check whether it is really, whether it really has superior efficacy compared to cisplatin gemcitabine. And this is the graph of pemetrexid cells. So after that trial, the sales of pemetrexid has climbed so much in billions of dollars without any new indication. It has always had the same indication for uh, lung cancer and mesothelioma. But this, after the publication of the trial, the cells has shoot up. So it should be a really solid evidence. Now let's see. If we see the results of the trial on which these recommendations are based, then we see that overall survival for cisplatin pemetrexid was non-inferior to cisplatin gemcitabine. And it is 10.3 versus 10.3. So absolutely no difference. But now they looked at subgroup of ischoimous and non-ischoimous histology. And they saw that statistically superior for pemetrexid versus gemcitabine in case of adenocarcinoma. But in case of ischoimous, uh, Gemcitabine had superior survival. So this is the basis for all our recommendations. It is the subgroup analysis from a trial. And on that basis, we have been using pemetrexid for non ischoimous histology. So we wrote a paper about it very recently in JAMA Oncology. And our heading was a bit provocative, the billion dollar subgroup analysis. Now, if we look at the data, of that subgroup analysis. Now you see, this is the data. This is the actual data. Non-ischoimous, 
0.03 p value ischemia 0.05 for cp versus cg and in ischemia for uh, the gemcitabine is superior to pemetrexid in non ischemia pemetrexid is superior to gemcitabine this is the only data that we have now the amazing thing is as you can look here they have conducted 19 subgroup analysis 19 a p value of 5% means if you conduct 20 subgroup analysis by default you will get at least one positive if you didn't get at least one positive we would have been surprised and this is the basis for those billion dollar of industry and another way of looking at it yeah, this is the adenocarcinoma group non squamous group and this is the squamous group they are nearly touching the bar of 1.0 another way of looking at it is this is the overall hazard ratio bar so if your confidence interval touches the overall hazard ratio bar, then it is probably not significant. And this clearly crosses this. So even though you have a p-value of 0.03, this is not significant simply because you have, simply because number one, this was a subgroup analysis. Number two, you have conducted 19 subgroup analysis, so you will definitely get one positive. Number three, as we can see, yes, as they mentioned clearly, P values were not adjusted for multiple comparisons. At least you could adjust it. So these were not adjusted for multiple comparisons. What happens if we adjust? Let's see. If we adjust using bone ferroni correction, then you divide the value of 5% by the number of subgroup analysis you have conducted. And actually, it would have been significant only if the P would have been less than 0 0.0026. And their P of 0 0.03 is clearly above this. And our all guidelines are based on this subgroup analysis. <coughs> and now let's look at the PFS and OS graphs. The upper graphs are of OS, the lower graphs are of PFS, and this is for pemetrexid versus uh, gemcitabine for non squamous This is the same thing for PFS. Now you see there is no change in PFS, right? PFS is the same, the overlapping curves. There is benefit in overall survival, which they showed before with subgroup analysis. Now pemetrexid is not immunotherapy. You can't, in case of immunotherapy, you can expect no change in PFS, but translating to OS because of, uh, you can see the crossover of Kaplan Meier graphs, some cases of pseudo progression, taking longer duration to show response, and we are not using immune resist criteria. So, in case of immunotherapy, we can accept that there can be no change in PFS, but there can be change in OS. But pemetrexid is a chemo, it doesn't do so. So, you can see that PFS is same. But there is change in OS. So this also tells us that this OS advantage is simply because we have looked at multiple subgroups and it is not a real advantage. Yes. And another way to look at subgroup analysis is to confirm it with another trial. So there was another trial called point, point break trial in which there was pemetrexid versus paclitaxel. There, there was also bevacizumab extra added. But in one group we had pemetrexid, in other group we had paclitaxel, and in this case also there was no difference in overall survival. So if pemetrexid really improved survival, then we could have seen difference in this study as well. So the conclusion is we are basing our recommendations and we are paying such high prices because pemetrexid is not a cheap drug, although it's a chemotherapy. So we are paying such high prices to drugs in the hope of benefiting the patient without having a solid evidence to convince of that benefit. Yeah, so it's the same thing. OS did not improve with pemetrexid. Now let's change gears to ovarian cancer. This was published last year about volasativ in ovarian cancer. This was a phase two trial. And the primary endpoint of this trial, this phase two trial, the primary endpoint was 24 week disease control rate. Now this is the drug. This is the standard arm chemotherapy. Now we can clearly see that the response rate is in fact more in the chemotherapy arm. So the velocitive drug is in fact performing worse than the control arm. So this is a phase two trial. What would be our conclusion? Our sensible, our sensible conclusion would be we should not go to phase three. This is a bad drug. But let's see what happened. This is the kaplan meier graph. And this red bar, I did not put it. This is in the original paper. In the original paper, they put this red bar to show that at 54 weeks, that means at one year, Six, six people with velocitive are progression free compared to no people in the control arm. What does that even mean? 
this is not a this is not a pre specified endpoint just you are just picking one particular data to say that this drug is good and we want to do phase 3 this is that is the endpoint anyone looking at the endpoint would say this drug should not be uh, moved to phase 3 and there is a couple of graph published in jco and this bar is being printed on the paper for making highlight of this particular benefit i find it very very absurd and then the conclusion and this is the result of course and in the result they mention not only about the 24 week dcr rate but they specifically mention that six patients receiving bolasatib achieved pfs for more than one year whereas no patient received it makes no sense and the conclusion is yeah the conclusion is the observed treatment effect is sufficient to justify further study within a large phase 3 trial. So, we'll, we are going to have a large phase 3 trial with 1500 patients. We'll probably have 5 days of benefit, which will be significant because we enrolled 1500 patients. And then FDA or EMA will have to approve that because it's reached less than 0 0.05 of P. And we have confusion in the clinic whether we should use it or not. And we have a real example for that. Now, let's see this ovarian cancer trial, nintidinib, ego over 12 trial, published last year in Lancet Oncology. The conclusion of this Lancet paper is nintidinib is an active first line treatment that significantly increases PFS. Sounds very exciting, okay? Active treatment increasing PFS. Let's look at the data. The data is it improved PFS by 18 days, 1 at 18 days. It is significant, no doubt. It is less than 0 0.05. But how can an 18 days of benefit be significant? Because you are enrolling 1,400 patients. If you enroll this many patients, if you overpower a trial, then you can, it's like the case of James, uh, erlotinib in pancreatic cancer. 10 days of benefit, it will reach significance. So we published a paper in cancer because we think that in ovarian cancer, there is a huge persistent optimism. So optimism is a good thing. Optimism is a good thing, especially in oncology, but can there be such a thing as too much optimism sometimes? So knowing when to give up is, I think, as much wise as knowing when to pursue. And so another aspect of sense in oncology would be avoiding wisely. And I use this term avoiding wisely because in US, Canada, UK, I don't know, in Belgium, there are movements called choosing wisely. And so whenever someone says choosing wisely, we always have the subconscious belief that we have to choose something. That means we have to do something. But we need to be aware of the fact that there is always an option not to do anything, especially for terminally ill patients and patients with poor PS. So I prefer the term avoiding wisely so that we know that there is always an option to avoid doing harmful things. And in which I, I made a list of some of the examples of low value practices in oncology that we can safely avoid and prevent uh, financial toxicity without uh, uh, causing any detrimental effect to the patient. And this was uh, also covered by Medscape. So uh, what I mean to say is we should always be looking for strategies such as these that we can use to lessen the financial burden of cancer treatment and it's our collective responsibility and that would be one more thing that center of oncology should do and another important thing to think about is sensible spending because money is always a scarce resource no matter in which country we are living nobody has infinite resources for research or for treatment so we need to be also careful about what research to fund what research to spend money on this is not from oncology, but I just want to give you some example. There was a paper published in which they studied the influence of patient-clinician relationship on healthcare outcomes. And their conclusion was the patient-clinician relationship has a small but statistically significant effect on healthcare outcomes. I mean, why do we need such studies? We should be good physicians. We should be good to our patients. We should communicate them very well. Do we need any study to be a good doctor, to talk well to the patient? I mean, if this study said there was no significant effect, would we be bad doctors from tomorrow? Because there was the, the study says there is no effect on outcome, so I can treat you the way I want, no? So we don't need a good study that says it is significant to become a good doctor. So 
Spending money or funding money on such research is a waste of resources. There are other important questions to answer. One other example, babies cry most in UK, Canada, Italy and Netherlands. Why do I need to know this? I don't need to know this. And why do you need to spend money on such, such, such research? People are funding such type of studies. There are tens of PhDs involved, two or three postdoc fellows, one professor, two assistant professors. Why do we need to know this information? What matters is whether my daughter cries or not at night and whether I can have a sound sleep or not. I don't care whether the baby in Canada cries or not. So we should channelize our funding from this research to research that actually matter. Now in case of oncology, uh, uh, this was a paper we published in Nature Reviews and we tried to, from that news, I tried to think, is there something like that we can translate to oncology, like some research that we can avoid, some trials that we can avoid, because patients are always few, our money is always few, so we can't conduct infinite number of trials testing infinite number of combinations. So we, our conclusion was, we saw that there, is, there are always exceptions, but in general, if a drug is not effective, does not produce good response as a single agent, then it is not usually beneficial to test the drug as a combination therapy. So if a drug, so whenever we want to test a combination therapy, we need to first check whether that drug is effective as a single agent or not. If it is effective as a single agent, it will probably have very nice effect when used in combination with other agents. But if it is ineffective as a single agent, then probably it is not effective when used in combination too. But of course there are exceptions. So our, our, our conclusion was clinical trials are costly, arduous, and patients remain a scarce resource. And if we keep pursuing agents who la that lack single agent activity, it opens the door to thousands and thousands of permutations and combinations of uh, treatment that we can test in trial, but we'll never have the resource to do so. Another example in oncology, uh, which I find very interesting, is the study of exercise in cancer. So I checked this uh, uh, some months ago. I I've checked in PubMed with a filter of RCT for exercise and cancer, and there were 1,039 RCTs evaluating the role of exercise in cancer. Again, why do, I need, why do we need such studies? We tell our patients, if you can exercise, you should exercise. Having a healthy lifestyle is always a good idea. If you can't exercise, if you are bedridden, if your PS is worse, then sleep. So why do we need to have studies or fund studies that says exercise seems to improve quality of life by Zero, a p-value of 0 0.03 in metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Okay, so what? What am I going to do tomorrow? So, in conclusion, uh, there are different priorities for high-income countries and low-income countries, and all the treatments cannot be translated equally in both the settings. So, we should be focusing on co-development. Co-development means working together to address, cons to address the issues of common need. For example, in high income countries, now we are obsessed with cancer moonshot. So the former US president announced he will be launching cancer moonshot project with millions of <laughs> dollars of funding. And everyone was super excited about it. Now what does cancer moonshot actually do? What are, what are its strategies? So it will focus on cancer immunotherapy and on precision medicine and things like that. So, Everyone was very, very excited. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. They were so excited and it created so much of hype in the media. Like everyone started to build their own moonshots. MD Anderson has its own moonshot program. And the billionaire Patrick Sunsong, he has his own moonshot program. Parker has his own moonshot. And now you see, this is such an embarrassing news. Now, MD Anderson and this billionaire are fighting over each other in law about who owns the term Munsat. One says, it is my word. The other says, no, it belongs to me. Why does it matter? We are all trying to work hard to improve survival or quality of life to our patients. It doesn't matter who owns the term Munsat. Uh, so we have forgotten the destination and we have become addicted to the path. But the elephant in the room question is, Moonshot seems so exciting, but how many patients' life is it actually going to save? That is the question that should be answered. It doesn't matter who, uh, whom does the word Moonshot belongs to. So let's try to see 
how many lives will this moonshot or uh, its components, immunotherapy and precision medicine actually save? Now this was published in Stat News in which they looked at immunotherapy and they looked at response rate. Of course, response rate is not a good mark of uh, immunotherapy, um, but they looked at how many patients will receive benefit from checkpoint inhibitors and for any type of cancer. They are looking at any type of cancer because nowadays patients with any type of cancer wants to get immunotherapy irrespective of whether it is approved or not. Um, we have seen patients with ovarian cancer come to our clinic saying, not asking doctor what do you think is the good treatment for me, but coming to our clinic saying, doctor are you going to give me nivolumab? So such has been the hype in the media and public that everybody thinks he or she should not die without having a test of checkpoint inhibitor. So for any type of cancer, the response rate was 8%, which is a pretty low response rate. And if we limit our analysis to the indications for which they have been approved, then the response rate is 26%, which is a decent response rate, but it is not as big as the media and public hype has thought it to be. Now going to precision medicine, the other part of Moonshot, for precision oncology, there is only one randomized control trial, the SHIVA trial, which showed that uh, precision approach did not improve outcomes compared to conventional approach. Of course, that trial is flawed and there are some problems with that trial. But the point is, we don't have any trial to show that it is good. We have one trial, it can be flawed, but it says it is negative and we don't have a single positive trial. And we had a Moscato trial, which is not an RCT, published uh, a month ago. And I commented uh, about it in my commentary in Journal of NCCN. And among 1,000 patients who were included, only 2.12% of the patients showed a response with the precision approach. So 2% of response rate is not as big as the news is trying to make. So, uh, OK, this is one more interesting study published in 2014 in JAMA by Tito Fozo et al in which they looked at all the drugs approved by FDA from 2002 to 2014, and they found that the median gain in OS was only 2.1 months. And you can see so many drugs that have not improved OS at all. This is the PFS graph, and you see many drugs that have not improved even PFS, which are approved only on the basis of response rate. And we are paying millions of mi and millions of dollars for these drugs. Now let's compare that with this graph. This is a graph showing cervical cancer mortality rate throughout the world. And the redder the graph is, the higher the mortality rate. Now you can see more than half of the globe is red. This is unacceptable because cervical cancer is a cancer that we can actually prevent with the use of HPV vaccine. And we can screen early with the use of test and we can detect early and we can cure cervical cancer early. In 21st century, no women should die of cervical cancer. We have been talking about moon shots and things like that, and we have been talking about curing cancer. Now, this is a cancer that we can actually prevent. Now, this is a cancer where people don't need to die. But you see, more than half of the world has a red graph. That means so many women are still dying of cervical cancer. Now, how much money or effort do you think it will take to convert this red into white graph? 5% to 10% of the Moonshot program. But we are not interested in investing in these programs, but we are, invest we are interested in investing thousands and millions in programs that are improving overall survival by 2.1 months, progress and free survival by three months, and we are getting super excited about it. This is not acceptable. So we need to work together to address common interests. Of course, the interests of High income countries are important and the interest of low income countries are also important and there are opportunities where we can work together. It's not a one way traffic. This shows an example of research that came from low income countries which are equally of interest and opportunity for high income countries. For example, <coughs> one example would be the use of arsenic uh, in M3 acute myeloid leukemia. So that was evidence coming from low-income country and is still the standard of care in all high-income countries. And the opposite is also true. The research that came from high-income countries and that are of interest and use 
to both the low income countries and high income countries. For example, the use of aspirin to prevent uh, colorectal cancer recurrence after surgery. So this is my last slide. So in conclusion, maybe we need a cancer ground shot rather than a moon shot. And maybe we need to go global and think about everyone in the world before shooting for the moon. Thank you very much.